Bethlehem College and Seminary is still accepting applications for the coming academic year. For more information, visit bcsmn.edu. Thank you all for coming. Uh, due to the time limits, and my students know how I like time limits, I'm going to stick to my script as much as possible, if I can put it that way, try not to ad lib. Uh, I might point out uh, for the references that I'm using from Richard Hooker, I am using this new uh, modern English version published by Davenant Press. It is excellent. Uh, also, if you want to know more about uh, natural theology and it's been the history of thought, uh, beginning with the pre-Socratics, working up to the end of the Reformation period, you can check out my book on natural theology over there. Uh, and uh, that's as far as that goes for marketing. Let's jump right into it. So, uh, the Belgian Confession, uh, composed in French in 1561, two years prior to the birth of Richard Hooker, was adopted as one of the three forms of unity by Reformed theologians who participated at the Synod of Dort in 1618 and 1619. The three forms of unity, for those who don't know what that is, uh, it contains the canons of the Synod of Dort, uh, the Heidelberg Catechism, and the Belgian Confession, and it was composed with the purpose of establishing the unity of Reformed churches at that time period. The Belgian Confession is, in fact, recognized as one of the fundamental articulations of essential Reformed doctrines for Reformed churches, rivaled perhaps only by the Westminster Confession. Uh, for us Baptists, the London Baptist Confession comes in third, probably, uh, and yet very useful. Uh, concerning the means by which God makes himself known to mankind, the Belgian Confession says the following, and I quote, uh, We know him by two means. First, by the creation, preservation, and government of the universe, which is before our eyes as a most elegant book, wherein all creatures, great and small, are as so many characters leading us to contemplate the invisible things of God, namely his eternal power and Godhead, as the Apostle Paul saith, Romans 1.20, all, all which things are sufficient to convince men and leave them without excuse. Secondly, he makes himself more clearly and fully known to us by his holy and divine word, that is to say, as far as is necessary for us to know in this life to his glory and our salvation. Prior to the mid-1800s, this view of natural theology was common currency among Reformed theology. The many confessions and catechisms composed during the 16th and 17th centuries testify to the fact that the great majority of Reformed theologians, pastors, thought that one part of Orthodox Christian theology was the affirmation that it is possible to know that God is and something of the divine nature. And this because these are revealed to man in nature, and man's rational abilities are divinely designed to be able to recognize these truths. The Reformed theologians of the 16th and 17th centuries were more or less convinced about how much could be known. They generally agreed that it was in fact possible, and it could be known via intuition or inference. And you'll find, frequently if you read their works, you will find them appealing to both on a regular basis. They were convinced about this in part because this is what the scriptures teach. And you will find this when you read their confessions. When they talk about this, they refer almost all the time to at least Psalm 19 and Romans 1, 19 to 20 as the proof of natural theology. They also argued, if you'll read this in their commentaries, that the truth, that this truth in natural theology was the ground of the righteous judgment of God by which all men are condemned, Romans chapter 1. Uh, in fact, this doctrine was so widely accepted that it was not only included in the confessions and catechisms, but Francis Turretin, near the end of the 17th century, was able to say, uncontroversially, to his Reformed audience, our controversy here is with the Socinians. The Socinians are, were a group of heretics uh, on, on a number of different doctrines. He said, our controversy here is with the Socinians, who deny the existence of any such natural theology or knowledge of God. Note, he says, the Orthodox on the contrary, uniformly teach that there is a natural theology, partly innate, derived from the book of conscience by means of common notions, and partly acquired, drawn from the book of creatures, creatures discursively. This statement by Turretin was not controversial for the Reformed theologians of the time. It was a statement of fact. And it would have been taken as, as just an expression of the common opinion of the Reformed theologians of the 17th century. Interestingly enough, as the 19th century came to a close, this Reformed conviction, which had been in place since the 1500s, 
started being questioned by a number of theologians who called themselves Reformed and claimed adherence to those Reformed confessions, namely uh, Karl Barth, Cornelius Van Til, and their followers. Their contemporary 20th century disciples continued to wage war on the historical doctrine, Reformed doctrine of natural theology. It is, of course, worth noting, just so we don't get the idea that as the 19th century comes to a close and the 20th century begins, that all of a sudden all Reformed theologians all of a sudden abandoned natural theology, that in that same time period, some of the greatest theologians that we know, Charles Hodge, B.B. Warfield, Gerhardus Voss, J. Gresham McMockham, and John Murray, all heartily affirm the Reformed doctrine of natural theology. Some of those I named because they are, in fact, Princeton theologians who became associated with Westminster uh, Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, where Van Til became a well-known professor. His own colleagues, J. J. Gresham Mocken, who founded the school, and John Murray, who was at the time the New Testament professor at that school, disagreed with him on how to properly interpret Romans chapter 1, 19 to 20, and on the doctrine of natural theology. So it's not like in the 19th to 20th century, all of a sudden, Reformed theologians abandoned natural theology. Though the contemporary Reformed rejection of doctrine of natural theology has become so commonplace and vocal that many people are in fact surprised when they hear a Reformed theologian affirming natural theology. Uh, and, and by the way, when I say many are uh, surprised to hear a Reformed theologian affirming natural theology, even among Roman Catholics, uh, this is, there is a surprise. Uh, a recent book published in 2019 by Francis Beckwith uh, called, uh, ne ne wonderful title, Never Doubt Thomas. <laughs> I thought I'd get a couple laughs on that one. Uh, he, he portrays Reformed theology as largely abandoning natural theology. And he starts with one or two theologians who are Reformed and then moves to the claim, this just is the Reformed doctrine of natural theology. And it isn't. However, because he's dealing primarily with a couple 20th century Reformed theologians, that does give that, that gives the uh, illusion that it is the Reformed doctrine. What I want to do tonight, I'm going to give you my broad goal, is I would like to point out that, that, that this is in fact a deviation from Reformed doctrine. How can we do that? There are a number of different ways. One of the ways we could do, at least kind of like what I do in my book, is you could uh, do a sprint through the history of Reformed thought in the 16th and 17th century, and basically quote everybody you can, you can grab, put your hands on, and uh, if, you, if you look at my book, you'll see there's a little bit of what I did. Uh, tried to not actually quote them, just give you the references so you can follow them up. Uh, or what we could do is we can choose an, an indiv individual from that time period who is rep representative, and look at what they say, and that's what we're going to do tonight. That's why we're looking tonight at Richard Hooker and Natural Theology. Mm. Now, I could have chosen any number of theologians, John Calvin, Theodore Beza, uh, Peter Martyr Vermigli, Zonke, Junius, Zwingli, Bollinger would have been very interesting in his, his book, his works called The Decades. He actually probably has more information on natural theology than even Richard Hooker does. Uh, it goes into much greater detail, quoting pagan uh, and uh, Greek philosophers extensively. Uh, however, we are choosing Richard Hooker, and there are a number of reasons to justify this choice. Uh, I'm going to try and skim through a number of reasons why we're looking at Richard Hooker tonight. First of all, uh, to a certain extent, this is a contribution to knowledge uh, as far as theology is concerned. Uh, if you do research on Richard Hooker, there is not a lot of work on his views of natural theology. Most of the work that's done in secondary literature on Richard Hooker is on his views of natural law, which is not surprising. It's the laws of ecclesiastical polity, and he is giving a, a very good defense of natural law in here and how it should be used in the church. Uh, so there's not a lot of work on his natural theology. So this is something of a contribution to research. Uh, secondly, he was an important 16th century Reformed theologian. He was born around 1553-1554, and he died in the year 1600. As a younger contemporary, he was alive and most like, may have interacted with, he most likely knew some of the people, such as Vermigli, Calvin, Zanke, Beza, John Jewell, and Heinrich Bullinger. He was alive while they were alive. He serves as a testimony to reform thought in that time period. And interestingly enough, he also serves as a bridge between the earlier generations of Reformed theologians in the early 1500s and the two major uh, determinations of Orthodox Reformed thought at the Synod of Dort in 1617 18 
and then later on at the Westminster Confession. So he serves as a bridge between those two eras. On top of that, not only does he serve as a bridge, he is in fact a good representative of that time period. He's in full continuity with those who precede him on this subject in particular. One more, a couple more reasons that might be more interesting for those who are in attendance tonight. Uh, one of the most influential Protestants of the 20th, 20th century is C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis, for those who don't know, was heavily influenced by Richard Hooker. Arguably, Richard Hooker was the main theologian that influenced C.S. Lewis's thought. In his most prestigious academic work, known as Poetry and Prose in the 16th century, Lewis says of Hooker, uh, I have a bunch of quotes here, I'm just going to pick one that's really fun. Uh, he, describing the laws, he says this, The mellow gold of the polity is the work of prudence, of art, of moral virtue, and as Hooker would no doubt have said, of grace. It is also an obedience to decorum. That is high praise for this book. He then says that there are two reasons why we constantly return to Hooker. One, the polity marks a revolution in the art of controversy. This is a revolutionary book for that time period. But secondly, he says, every system offers us a model of the universe. Hooker's model has unsurpassed grace and majesty. Few models, universes, are more filled, one might say, more drenched with deity than his. All things that are of God, and only sin is not, have God in them, and he them in himself likewise, yet their substance and his, whole, and his wholly differ. God is unspeakably transcendent, but also unspeakably imminent. That is how C.S. Lewis praises this book. So I would suggest if we like C.S. Lewis, we should also like Hooker. Uh, secondly, well, or, or, or fifthly, I guess, technically, uh, Hooker challenges us. Uh, Hooker is a, presents a challenge to the contemporary Protestant church, and especially to those who tend to reject natural theology in favor of what it has been called over the years, uh, either scripturism, or Biblicism, uh, most recently by Michael Burt, a neo-reformed theologian down in Australia in his book Evangelical Theology, he calls it naive Biblicism. And Richard Hooker presents a very strong challenge to those who would fit into that camp. Now you can ask me later, perhaps during the questions, what is meant by a naive Biblicist, and how would you know if you are one? Uh, you know, I could do like a little birding exercise, how to recognize the naive Biblicist in the wild. Um, <laughs> For now, we're just going to move forward. I'm going to point something that C.S. Lewis mentions. He says this, Hooker has already asked and answered questions which Cartwright and Travers had never considered and which are fatal to their narrow scripturism. Hmm. So Hooker challenges us. And then finally, he helps us to better understand the Reformation principle of sola scriptura. And what I want to do tonight is as we are looking at natural theology, I want to ask a very important question. Does that compromise the Reformed doctrine of sola scriptura? So that's what we're going to try to do tonight. How are we going to do this? Well, first we're going to start by giving a quick overview of what natural theology is, how Hooker understands it. Then we're going to look at how Hooker would respond to the challenge of naive biblicists in relationship to sola scriptura. And we are going to answer a number of challenges brought against him by the, naive, the, by, by, by the biblicists of his own time period. Arguably, those challenges will also be valid for us today, and so will his responses. So what is natural theology? First, a quick summary of what the Reformers meant when they talked about it. By natural theology, we mean that knowledge of God, that God is and something of his nature, which man can obtain through rational reflection upon their own observations of nature. This includes not only observations of the cosmos in general, gazing at stars, for example, but contemplating your own self, because you are, in fact, a part of the cosmos. So it's not just looking outwards, it's also being able to recognize that you are a creation of God, and can yourself be a testimony to the existence of God. And this, when we talk about natural theology, the doctrine usually entails the following affirmation, this is done, or possible can be done, without the aid of special revelation. In other words, you don't need the Bible to know that God is and something of his attributes. Natural revelation, what is that? It just is the cosmos in all of its parts. You are a part of natural revelation. Human beings are able to develop a natural theology from their observations of natural revelation because they are endowed by divine creation 
with the natural light of reason, and are ever and always helped by that divine grace which is extended to all men, regenerate or not. Though man's intellect and will have been damaged, tainted, or otherwise corrupted by sin, by original sin, the natural light of reason has not been entirely effaced, according to the reformers. Rather, the human intellect is still naturally directed towards truth and the joyful possession of it. By God's grace common to all men, humans can still discover and rejoice in the discovery of many truths about the cosmos, mankind, and its creator. Some may be wondering why I, they were seeing me walking around with this. This is where this comes. Th think of, in order to illustrate what natural theology, and, or natural revelation and natural theology are, uh, think about a great work of art. Now, I am not rich enough to be able to bring in here uh, the Mona Lisa, or some similar work of art, so I did bring in a work of art that I thought was appropriate, and also definite, definitively a work of art. Um, this is Calvin and Hobbes. I grew up on this. It's also appropriate to this evening. There's treasure everywhere. And where are, they, where are they? They're out in nature digging. So it's appropriate to this evening. A work of art. Uh, here we have what is arguably the only bi biography of Bill Watterson. Natural revelation. This is what we compare to natural revelation. This could be arguably compared to scriptures. Here we have someone telling us about God. More than what you can get from the work of art. Now here's the thing. What you find in the work of art should not con contradict what you find in the biography. Especially if it's an autobiography. Unfortunately for our sakes, uh, Bill Watterson never wrote an autobiography, and the person who wrote this biography, which is, as far as I know, the only one in existence, never actually got to talk to Bill Watterson. <laughs> so, if we are going to call this anything like scriptures, we have to say it's something like the Gospel of Luke. Oh, I see. You can follow that train of thought there. Um, so, natural revelation, if we were doing a natural theology of Bill Watterson, well, this comic book would be basically natural revelation. And then you're going to look at it, and you're going to examine it, and you're going to learn something about the artist. At least one thing should be immediately obvious. There is one. The artwork naturally reveals that there is an artist and something of it. We are able to know this because, as rational animals, we are able to recognize artistry behind art artwork. The artwork, the more it is directly created by the artist, the more it perfectly and infallibly reveals the artist. When there is an error in our natural theology, however, it is not because of natural revelation, but rather due to our own ignorance. That is, if I arrive at false conclusions based upon that work of art, it's not because of the work of art that I arrive at the false conclusions. That's my problem. Natural law, just to make one final distinction here, natural law, it refers to the body of moral knowledge which man can know through his rational observations of nature and of himself, of human nature. So there is a distinction between natural theology and natural law, where natural theology is about God, and natural law is about human morality. How does Hooker come to this? Well, it, should, it will come as, to no surprise, as no surprise to those who have read the laws, that Hooker is doing more natural law than natural theology. This is not to say, however, that he has nothing to say about natural theology, and what he does say is helpful. Uh, Torrance Kirby, uh, who is up at McGill, uh, and has arguably written some of the most important uh, secondary literature on Richard Hooker, uh, argues that Hooker's understanding of natural law is closely related to his understanding of natural theology. He notes this, and I quote, Hooker is certainly not alone among Reformation theologians in holding that the knowledge of God, and thus also of the eternal law, is attainable by means of both scripture and reason. Uh, quick parentheses here. He says not alone. That's an understatement. He is, a, he is surrounded by a, a group of, test, of, of many witnesses. Uh, it is furthermore a commonplace of the exegesis of the reformers that the twofold obligation to honor God and deal justly with one's neighbor is taught by both the natural and divine law. The interplay between the natural and the revealed knowledge of God gives shape to the magisterial reformers' complex dialectical approach to the authority of natural law. And the theory of natural law in turn constitutes a critical link between theology and ethics in their thought as well. He goes on to note that, for Hooker, the foundation of a theological reflection on ethics is the twofold knowledge of God. 
Knowledge of the Creator is not to be confused with knowledge of the Redeemer. Note, that's a distinction we find in Calvin. Yet a complete account of Christian virtue demands both species of knowing. The first point we want to make here, then, is that for Hooker, there is an important sense in which natural law is dependent upon natural theology. Hooker explains this point, in his own words, in his discussion of the nature of laws and the grounding of laws in general. He says, and I quote, Nearly everything works according to a law subject to some superior who has authored it. Only the works and operations of God have him as both their worker and as their law. The very being of God is a sort of law to his own working. Note here, the existence of a law, according to Hooker, seems to entail the existence of a lawgiver. Laws are typically put in place by a lawgiver. He will go on to explain that natural law is that part of eternal law, that is the very being of God, which specifically relates to the sensible cosmos, and which is distinguished between, on one hand, the laws of nature, that is the laws of non-rational, sensible things, and the law of reason, which is the law which applies to the eternal law as it applies to human beings. For Hooker, then, natural law could be understood as human nature as it is in the mind of God. And it is knowable by rational observation of human nature as it is instantiated in creation. That is, when we notice that, when we realize true moral, true moral statements, we are thinking God's thoughts after him. When we realize that from nature. For Hooker, not only is natural law grounded in God's very being, but some of the clear dictates of natural law flow from the natural knowledge that God is. That is, that man should worship God is grounded in the truth that God is. And that truth is knowable naturally. It, it, it is a necessary consequence, in other words. I know naturally that God is, and therefore I know that he should be worshipped. I mean, I know how. I know that. It is because man does not worship God that, as Paul says in Romans 1, 18, 20, he is without excuse. Now the question is, can man, however, truly know God? The Christian church has historically taught that God is beyond our understanding and ineffable. Hooker situates himself within the bounds of Christian orthodoxy, explaining that, and I quote, Although it is life to know him, and joy to mention his name, our surest knowledge is that we do not know him as he truly is, nor can we. Our safest eloquence is silence, confessing without confession that his glory is inexplicable and his greatness above our capacity and reach. He is above and we are on earth, therefore let our words be wary and few. Mm -hmm. Though God transcends all our attempts to describe him, though his nature is such that human words are but weak attempts to describe that which is indescribable, Hooker recognizes that church has also consistently maintained that we are able to predicate some things of God. He notes that we are able to know through nature, for example, that God is oneness itself. That there is no real distinction in God between essence and existence. And all that is in God is God. We also know through scriptures alone, not through nature, that God is triune. It's in this context that Hooker introduces the notion of natural theology. He explains that our feeble knowledge of the internal divine relations of the Trinity are entirely mediated through the scriptures and are deepened through our reflections upon them, but that other truths about God are knowable through our reasoned observations of the natural world. He says, Even wise and learned pagans acknowledge that there must be some first cause upon which the existence of everything else depends. Nor do they call this cause anything other than an agent. That is, something that knows what it does and why it does it. And does so according to a certain order or law. He names a number of pre-Christian Greeks who have arrived at these conclusions. Such as Homer, Hermes Trismegistus, Anaxagoras, Plato, the Stoics. Elsewhere, not in this specific section I'm referring to, he also refers to Aristotle. He does not suggest that they got everything right about God, nor that they were able to infer all that they could have inferred from nature. He does point out that they did get some things right about God. He goes on to explain that all these admit 
that this first cause took counsel or followed reason or observed a certain course. In other words, constant order and law is kept, which order must be its own author. Again, he says, concerning God, I don't have the time to explain how, little by little, men come to know by nature alone, not only that there is a God, but also what power, force, and wisdom he has, and how everything depends on him. This being granted, then, men have recognized our relationship to God as his children, and the fact that all good things depend on him as their first cause, and thus have arrived at such laws as, quoting Plato, in all things we do, or in all things we go about, his aid is to be craved. In other words, we should seek his divine aid. And, quoting, quoting Aristotle, he cannot have a sufficient honor done unto him, but the utmost of that we can do to honor him we must do. Note, Plato saying we need to call upon God for help, and Aristotle saying we need to worship him. The pagan philosophers affirmed these and other claims, and this is not just a historical truth, it's not just a historical fact to which you can go and point to these philosophers and say, look, without the aid of holy scriptures, they came to these conclusions. He also provides us with an argument. He doesn't go into great detail, and it's not surprising. I've got a footnote on that if you want to hear why. Uh, but the argument that he gives us, in fact, resembles, if it isn't precisely, Thomas Aquinas' fifth way, the teleological argument. Here's how we, this is how he reads this. She, nature, is so dexter, dexterous and skillful that no rational being can, can, with all their intelligence, do what she does without understanding and knowledge. Nature must have some director of infinite knowledge who guides her in all her ways. And who is the guide, who is the guide of nature? But the God of nature, in whom we live and move and have our being. Acts 17.28 Those things which nature is said to do are performed by the divine skill with nature as the instrument. The artful workings of nature come not from any divine knowledge found in her, but only in her guide. Since natural things which are not voluntary agents must necessarily obey certain laws, you'll find in Aquinas' fifth way he's going to say that things that without reason are constantly directed to a single end, always or for the most part, they must be directed by some agent. And he gives the example of a, uh, a bow and an arrow, where the arrow, if you put it on a table, is not going to go anywhere. To, be, to end up in the target, it must be directed there by a rational agent. Their many workings are perfectly designed for the many different purposes they achieve. But though they do what is fitting, they know neither what they do nor why they do it. From this, we can see that everything they do in this way must be the result of some agent who knows appoints, holds up, and even fashions it. He presents this as an argument to demonstrate that God is. This is, in fact, the fifth way from Aquinas' Summa Theologiae. He also appeals to one of the Ciceronian arguments to demonstrate that God is, which we could call the argument from the universality of belief. In discussing how men recognize goodness, Hooker discusses in a manner which foreshadows C.S. Lewis's discussion of the Tao in his work, The Abolition of Man, the fact that all men of all times appear to recognize some moral truths. The university of these beliefs, suggests Hooker, is evidence that these beliefs are not simply the invention of some religious, social, or political group, but rather the rational recognition of truths which are embedded in reality itself, in everything that is. This claim, which is made of natural law, arguably also applies to God. That is, the truth that God is, is a fact of reality. Just as a painting or a sculpture testifies in every brush stroke or chisel mark that it was made by an intelligent artist or sculptor, so the sensible cosmos in every part of it consistently testifies to the truth that it was made by an intelligent creator. Mm -hmm. Reginald Guerrero Legrand notes, quoting A.D. Satyange, both of these are French uh, Thomistic uh, philosophers and theologians, that making the paintbrush infinitesimally long does not remove the need for an artist. Make it as long as you want. You still need the artist's hand to move the brush. The, heart, the human intellect is, by divine creation, such that it readily observes, happily, joyfully observes, the hand of the artist in the work of art. 
For Hooker, when man observes the natural world and rightly comes to the conclusion that the very presence of the sensible cosmos entails that there is an intelligent, provident, and powerful creator, man is not submitting creation or God to reason. Nor is he using reason autonomously to judge as to whether God is or is not. Rather, when man does that, this is nothing more than the conforming of the human intellect to reality. Man is not imposing his own thoughts on creation. He is finally submitting his intellect and will to God's. In other words, just as the acceptance, if I could draw this over to biblical literature, to, to the Bible, just as the acceptance of the biblical teaching that Jesus is God incarnate and the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world is a submitting of our intellect to the word God, when you accept that as true, so the recognition that God is, and that God is the wise, powerful, provident creator of the cosmos, is a submitting of your intellect to nature, which God created. Inversely, just as it is a rebellion against the word God to deny that Jesus is God, or, that it, or to deny that it is through his sacrifice that we are saved, just so, it is a rebellion against reality itself to deny that God is and that God is wise, powerful, provident, and the creator of the cosmos. Natural theology, in fact, is not man protesting against God, or raising up his intellect against God, demanding his autonomy from his creator. It is rather man submitting to God. As in Hooker's time with Thomas, Car with Thomas Cartwright, so today, biblicists are often so zealous in elevating the scriptures that they undermine their very project by supplanting nature, and human reason. Like the schoolyard bully, some contemporary theologians seem to think that the only way to elevate scriptures is to crush everything else. With that in mind, we're going to turn and look at some biblicist arguments brought against Richard Hooker and how he responded to them in his own time. And one of the things that I'd like to note is these very same arguments are still being used today, strangely enough. Objection one. Uh, that natural theology is based on Greek thought, therefore should be rejected. Uh, this may not be as common back then as it is today. Uh, in fact, arguably, if you go back and read the literature produced in the 16th and 17th century, Reformed theologians were largely happy to engage with the pagan philosophers, and they quoted them quite frequently. Today, however, some suggest that the problem with natural theology uh, specifically that natural theology which we see developing throughout the history of the church, uh, right all the way into the Reformation period, the problem, they say, is not so much that God is not manifest in nature, but that a natural knowledge of God which springs out of pagan thought, such as the observations of Plato and Aristotle, such a natural philosophy would be tainted with human error and therefore must be abandoned. It cannot, because of the product of sinful pagans, say anything true of God. In response to this concern, Hooker would happily joyfully respond in chorus with almost every church theologian throughout history that even the pagans have discovered truths about reality and God. I could quote too many people, it would take us way over time. I, meant, I, I point you just towards Augustine and his On Christian Doctrine, or City of God. He would not only say that, he would say that we, we should not reject these truth claims for the simple, uh, I would say simplistic, reason that these truths were first discovered and articulated by pagans. All truth the church has consistently repeated throughout the centuries is God's truth. God made man in his own image, meaning no less than that, man is an entity which desires, pursues, and is able to know truth. To, all, to know all truths is not given to any finite being, but to know truths. And in fact, to know the truth is the proper end of the human intellect. If a man, regenerate or unregenerate, discovers a truth about the sensible cosmos, this truth is not all of a sudden falsified because the person in question has other false ideas about reality. If that were the case, I would submit, then none of us would know any truths because we all, whether we would like to admit it or not, have false beliefs about reality. I'd make the joke myself excluded, but I, you, know, you know, that's just too obvious of a joke. Um, when Christians historically adopted classical, metaphysical, and epistemological terminology in their articulation of Christian truths, 
They did so not because Plato and Aristotle or Cicero said it. It wasn't because, oh, this great philosopher said it, that we adopt it. On the contrary, they adopted it because it was a precise and accurate way to describe reality as it was observed. As Aquinas says in his sentences on De Caelo et Mundo, the study of philosophy aims not at knowing what men feel, but at what is the truth of things. In other words, we don't care so much what Aristotle said, except in so much as it's true. And by the way, Augustine said that of himself. He told us, don't take anything I say unless it's true, and anything I say that's not true, get rid of it. Aquinas, by the way, said the same thing of his own writings, echoing Augustine. The atheist knows, as well as the Christian, many truths about the sensible cosmos. One truth about the sensible cosmos, which the ancient Greek philosophers discovered, was that it is caused by a wise, provident, uncaused creator they called God. Hooker notes that God is pleased when man uses reason to judge rightly about reality and about his actions. He says this, The nature which he, which he himself has given us cannot but delight him when we exercise it without disobeying his commandments. In other words, when we arrive at truths about reality, using that very ability to reason, which he put in us, we wouldn't be human without it. When we do that, he is happy. Because we are acting exactly the way he created us to act. Now, more, more important than that minor quibble is the suggestion that natural knowledge about God and human morality compromises the Reformation principle of sola scriptura and the authority of, of Christian scriptures. It is thought that if there is any source other than scriptures wherein humans can discover truths about God, man, and human morality, this would somehow undermine the authority of scriptures. Hooker refutes this claim so soundly that it is a wonder people still raise this question. Let's start with defining sola scriptura. Bradford Littlejohn, in his introduction, which is excellent, by the way, to uh, Hooker's Laws, explains that for Hooker, the doctrine of sola scriptura me meant that, and I quote, Scripture was the only infallible and finally authoritative standard in matters of faith, and thus the only basis on which any doctrine or action could be required of the Christian conscience as needful for salvation. I have a very long footnote in which I document a number of other approaches to sola scripture, and I will save that for another time, unless someone wants to ask me a question. Hooker analyzes this specific statement according to its parts, explain the primary purpose of Scripture is to, and I quote, reveal to us our supernatural duties, that is, to inform us of that which is necessary for salvation. Hooker points out that this statement, quote unquote, necessary for salvation, cannot be taken to refer to all that is necessary to know for salvation without qualification. Otherwise, he says, and I quote, we cannot exclude any philosophy, art, or science of note from the things that scriptures must contain. His point seems to be that to properly understand the scriptures, there are a certain number of technically extra-biblical things that must be known. I'll give you a couple quick examples. How about this one? Language. You've got to know some language to be able to read the Bible, even to be able to interpret it. If you cannot understand some language in which the Bible is translated, which includes grammar, syntax, minimal elements of logic, you cannot even read the scriptures, let alone understand them. You couldn't even understand someone communicating them to you. So language is a prerequisite for the ability to understand scriptures, but you are not taught language by the scriptures. In other words, another way of putting this is there's no divinely inspired language, despite some who thought the Hebrew language was. Um, you also need to know the things of the natural world to which our words refer. Words are signs, which are used to refer to things. So, for example, when Solomon says in the Proverbs, Go to the ant, thou slugger, learn her ways, and be wise. If you don't know what that word, ant, refers to in the natural world, that sentence is literally meaningless. That sentence, that phrase, only takes on meaning when you know what those words refer to in the natural world. Therefore, you arguably need a little bit, minimal, of at least some natural and theoretical sciences, probably a little bit of history, and some geography. Otherwise, the words of Scripture will be opaque to you. These things are necessary, absolutely and without qualification, for the proper understanding of Scriptures. The proper understanding of Scriptures being necessary for salvation. 
But if necessary for salvation means everything and, and I quote, anything that makes the way to salvation more plain, apparent, and obvious, end quote, then these things must be found in scriptures. Richard Hooper says they are not. Therefore, this is not how we must understand the doctrine of sola scriptura. Hmm. It's, a very, it's a very simple argument pointing out how we need to properly understand the doctrine of sola scriptura. He suggests, therefore, that we must understand, quote, unquote, necessary for salvation to mean, and I quote, only those beliefs and actions without which God does not ordinarily grant salvation. When he talks about all things, he explains, we must mean no more than all things of a certain kind, such as all things which we could not know by our natural reason. Scripture does indeed contain all of these things. However, it also presupposes that we first know and are persuaded of certain rational first principles. And building on that, Scripture teaches us the rest. In relationship to contained in the Scriptures, Hooker argues that this can only mean that which is either explicitly mentioned or is necessarily inferred from the Scriptures. In relationship to that which is explicitly mentioned, he says there is no debate, because it's obvious. With these nuances in mind, we understand the doctrine of sola scriptura does not enter into conflict with that which can be naturally known by the light of reason, of God, man, and human morality. Rather, the scriptures presuppose and perfect the natural light of reason. That the natural light of reason can demonstrate that God is something of the divine nature, the human responsibility to worship God, basic tenets of human morality, and that there will be a future judgment on those who do not obey natural law, this is presupposed by, and explicitly stated as knowable natu naturally, by the scriptures. Perfecting the natural light of reason, that is, completing or supplying what is lacking in natural reason, the scriptures reveal that this natural knowledge is sufficient to make man aware of his need for God, of his duties to God, and of his impending judgment, but is insufficient for his salvation. The scriptures alone are the final authority and standard of doctrine and faith in relation to that which is necessary for salvation. This leads Hooker to compose, compose the following summary. And they quote, When we praise the complete sufficiency of scripture, we must be careful not to exclude the benefit of the light of nature just because we insist on the necessity of a more divine light. There is nothing that prevents Scripture from enlightening a man's natural understanding, no, more, no matter what place or calling he holds within the Church of God, such that, grace perfecting nature, he will lack no instruction in any good work which God requires, whether natural or supernatural, or whether concerning men as individuals or as members of society. Thus we say that nature and scripture do serve us in such a way that neither alone are sufficient, but that both working jointly are so complete that we need nothing further to enjoy eternal joy. That nothing further he's referring to is church tradition, for example. Councils. It is important to note here that, a, that Hooker is not saying that human reason and scriptures are alone insufficient, but together sufficient but rather that nature and scriptures are alone insufficient, but together sufficient. Nature and scriptures are both given to, God, to man by God, and both reveal God. Divine revelation to man in nature and in scriptures presuppose that man has the ability as a creature, divinely endowed with reason, to recognize, receive, and understand communication through means of various signs, including natural signs, supernatural and sovereignly arrayed signs in history, language, and so on. Nature is the good and beautiful product of the divine artisan, serving as a sign which reveals both that God is and something of his nature. Scriptures are the inspired words or signs of God. Both are produced by God, spoken into being by God. Nature directly without intermediate. God directly spoke nature into being. Scriptures are spoken to being by God through the mediation of human authors who are inspired by the Holy Spirit. So that the Word of God is the inspired Word of God. As directly from God, there can be no contradiction between them in what they reveal about God, man, or morality. Both point to their cause, one with words, the other by its very being. If there is, then, any contradiction between that which is known through our reasoned observations of nature and that which is known 
through our exegesis of scriptures, it is neither the fault of nature, nor scriptures, nor of God. It is rather our own fault. Arguably, we deceive ourselves if we think that we make less mistakes in reading the scriptures than we do in understanding the cosmos. Or that the Holy Spirit is less inclined to guide men into divine truth through nature than through scriptures. Now you might say, but there's less in nature. Granted. But the Holy Spirit still guides to that less. The Holy Spirit may even use the words of pagan poets, philosophers, and prophets, and their observations about nature to point men to the truth. And when I say may, I say that with a strong, he did, we have proof of it in the Acts of the Apostles. Now, in responding to the errors of the Biblicists, having properly understood what we mean by the doctrine of sola scriptura, we can look at what they say. He first points out two equal and opposite errors concerning the authority of scriptures. On the one hand, some might imagine, in fact some perhaps even argue, that the scriptures are incomplete. They do not contain all that you need for salvation. Against this claim, Hooker argues that nothing more than what is revealed in the scriptures is necessary for salvation. All that might be added to the scriptures, such as tradition, as necessary for scriptures, must be rejected. For the scriptures perfectly and fully accomplish their purpose. That is, to inform man of all, in the qualified sense of all, that which could be not known through the natural reason, that is needed for his salvation. On the other hand, some tend to the opposite error. That is, pretending that scriptures contain all that is lawful to do and important to know about God, man, and morality. And that what is not therein contained is either not lawful or true, or not necessary for true Christian doctrine, for orthodoxy. Many today make just such an argument with the doctrine of God, for example. To this, Hooker explains that this is an error of extension. He says, There are those who make God's scope and purpose in delivering Holy Scripture larger than they ought, twisting it and stretching it further than he intended. This is no less dangerous, says Hooker, than the other error. The first error twists scripture, the scriptures and makes them insufficient for accomplishing the very goal that God set for them. The second error twists the scriptures by stretching them beyond the goal which God set for them. The second error, which is the one I find most often in Protestant circles today, could be likened to a pizza maker taking a piece of dough, which is, good, which is enough for a 10-inch pizza, but then attempting to stretch it out into a 20-inch 20 20 inch pizza. It will not work. Stressed too thin, holes will be created. In both of these errors, God's word is dishonored. It is made to say less than intended or more than it intended. Turning to the arguments of the Biblicist, Hooker provides two preliminary comments. His first comment is telling. No sound theologian, says Hooker, has ever denied that the will of God is partially revealed to us by the light of nature rather than by scripture alone. That's a strong statement, but not much stronger than the one we read by Turton at the beginning of this lecture. Up to the end of the 18th century, in fact, this claim could be taken to be true, for the most part. For not only did the Reformed theologians unanimously affirm the importance of natural law, but even Luther and some of the Anabaptist authors not only affirmed natural law, but appealed to it. The same can be said of natural theology, as we saw with Francis Turton. The second point he says is, Frequent attacks on the ability of human reason to know truths has led man to despise reason altogether, driving them into anti-intellectualism, skepticism, relativism, or the self-contradictory situation of using human reason to interpret scriptures to tell us that human reason cannot be used to know truth. Like the Manichaeans, and in the name of original sin, these people deface the Imagio Dei, even more than it has already been defaced by sin. Hooker will refute six arguments, and I can actually move through this fairly quickly. Hooker responds to each argument by explaining how they fail, either by overextension, partial truth, or by misinterpretation or misapplication of the scriptures themselves. Uh, the irony of this should not be lost on us. He refutes the Biblicists by pointing out to them that they have misinterpreted the Bible. Before he does this, he does note that the passage they use comparing, these are the first two points, the passages they use to compare the wisdom of God to the wisdom of man, he says, uh, they forget what it means to do a comparison. 
If I compare the wisdom of God to the wisdom of man, well, obviously, the wisdom of man will appear as folly. Compared to the wisdom of God, it could appear no other. However, that comparison is not to say that the wisdom of man is therefore not wisdom. It's a comparison. It'd be like saying, I wish I could give an example without going off of the camera here, it'd be like saying that the, uh, the kick of a, of a soccer ball that a child of five year olds does is nothing compared to an adult. Well, obviously. If I went and kicked that soccer ball in the net, or one of my colleagues who I play soccer with on occasion kicks the soccer ball into the net, you better get out of the way. It's, it's flying fast enough to go through the net. If a five-year-old kicks that ball, does that mean it's therefore not kicked because by comparison it is nothing? On the contrary, it is kicked. It may in fact roll into the net. Comparisons do not efface what, the, what they are comparing. To say that man's wisdom is as folly when compared to God is not to say that it is quite simply folly. Secondly, these men, says Hooker, take biblical condemnations as of false knowledge, learning, and wisdom to be of all human knowledge, learning, and wisdom, when this is in fact an overextension of the meaning and a misinterpretation of the text. The Bible condemns falsity, not truth. Sophistry, not right reasoning. Right reasoning just is philosophy. In relation to the sixth biblicist assaults on reason, Hooker notes, first, against those who use 1 Corinthians 2.14 to reject human reasoning, that when this verse says that natural man cannot know or receive the things of God, it is not referring to those truths about God which can be naturally known, but to those truths which are revealed only in Christian scriptures and which are necessary for salvation. Number two, against those who use Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 to reject all philosophy, Hooker notes that this verse must be understood to refer to false philosophies and not true philosophy of which there is, in fact, only one which is perpetually true and recognized by all men of all times and ethnicities, which is nothing more than right reasoning about reality, the conforming of the intellect to what is. True philosophy is a submission to, to God, in fact. He adds to this that one, in fact, cannot be aware of bad philosophy unless one has studied philosophy, in a, in a phrase which resembles closely what C.S. Lewis would say on that same subject. In response to the third objection, that philosophy is, is the cause of heresy, Hooker gives two responses. He points out, first of all, that though some philosophers have indeed fallen into the heresy, many orthodox theologians have in fact been philosophers. Augustine would be a wonderful example of that. In fact, if we looked at Reformed history, we realize that many of the Reformed and Lutheran theologians of the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries engaged in both theological and philosophical reflection, writing, and teaching. I can give you a couple quick examples. You guys know old John Wycliffe, right? Mm -hmm. Important uh, early reformer. He was also one of the greatest philosophers of his time. Wrote multiple treatises on philosophy, including... If anyone's, you know, thinking about buying me a Christmas gift, a $150 uh, edition uh, of a book called On Universals mm. that was written by John Wycliffe. He was recognized as one of the top philosophers of his time. Uh, others that I can mention, uh, Peter Martyr Vermigli, a very well-known contemporary of John Calvin. He wrote a commentary on Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, which are, in fact, his teaching notes from the seminary where he taught pastors the Nicomachean Ethics for the Reformation churches. How about, um, who else could I throw in there? Um, actually, interestingly enough, uh, a colleague uh, named David Sitzma is doing research on commentaries on the Nicomachean Ethics written during the Reformation period, and there were a number of them that were written by Reformed authors. Uh, and and I, I, I'm not going to name them all. There's, there are many, many, many Reformed and Lutheran authors who wrote philosophy. Secondly, he notes Heresy is not due to philosophy, that is right reasoning, but the abuse of reasoning. Mm. It's worth adding one more thing. Heresy in the church has typically been introduced from two causes. One, false reasoning about the sensible cosmos, and two, false reasoning about scriptures. Some theologians, Tertullian would be a wonderful example, introduced heresy into Christian theology not because of his philosophical principles, but because of a wrong reading of scriptures. In response to the fourth objection, based in a faulty interpretation of 1 Corinthians 1, 19-21, Hooker notes quite simply that all truth is God's truth, and that all truths 
are loved by those who love God, who is the truth. In response to the fifth objection, based on a faulty interpretation of Hebrews 4.12 and 1 Corinthians 2.4, where he's comparing the word of God and it's so high and so much better than human thinking, Hooker explains that the affirmation that reason is a necessary tool for the right interpretation of scriptures is neither a jab at nor a compromising of the doctrine of the perfection, exactitude, and sufficiency of the scriptures. Reason, used rightly to interpret scriptures rightly, is like a shovel or a plow that is a tool that is used for a higher purpose. You don't go shoveling holes for the sake of shoveling holes, unless you are in prison perhaps. You shovel holes for a higher purpose. You take a plow to till the land so that you can plant food and you'll grow food. There is a higher purpose for which this tool is used. And that is reason in relationship to the interpretation of scriptures. In response to the sixth objection, that the gospel is believed, not reasoned to, so the working of the Holy Spirit, Richard Hooker notes that natural reason is of use both for converting us and for confirming us in the faith. It is not by reason, but by grace we are saved. However, it is not without reason that we are saved. Faith is, in fact, an act of the intellect. We come to a conclusion. Today, in some Protestant circles, we are told that the proper, reformed approach to natural theology is that though man should be able to know something of God through nature, the natural man cannot. God may reveal himself in nature, but man is unable to read that revelation rightly. Interestingly enough, the growing tendency in theology from the late 14th century to the early 15th century was, in fact, to reject natural knowledge of God altogether. Scholars like William of Ockham argued for the failure of natural theology. He argued that it was better to believe that God is than to try to prove it. By the end of the 15th century, a form of Occam's nominalistic, voluntaristic fideism had become dominant in the schools that we call scholasticism, specifically of the Via Moderna and the modern Augustinian school. These schools of thought were the predominant schools of thought in the schools in the 100 years preceding the Reformation. The other schools that we often think about when we talk about the scholastics, such as the Albertists, the Thomists, and the Scotists, had, by this point, become relatively minor schools with lesser influence in Europe. It should come then as no surprise that Luther was skeptical towards natural knowledge of God. That's what he was taught in the scholastic schools that he went to. This was not something unique to Luther, nor was it, in fact, the Reformed approach. Rather, it was one of the main competitors in the marketplace of ideas in the 200 years preceding the Reformation. Now, why does that matter? This is, in fact, a powerful testimony to the Reformed understanding of the doctrine of natural theology that in the face of a theological culture which tended to reject natural theology, the Reformers not only readily affirmed it, but they made it a part of, of their Reformed orthodoxy by including it in all of their confessions and catechisms. In the face of the Roman Catholic rejection of natural theology at that time period, the, Ro the Reformers affirmed it. The irony of the contemporary resurgence of Biblicism and a contemporary rejection of classical philosophy, including natural theology, natural law, the irony is that it represents a return not to the early Reformed position, but to the position which the Reformers explicitly rejected, that they fought against, and which they in fact said was heretical. In a strange and ironic twist of fate, contemporary Protestant Biblicists chanting Ecclesia Reformata Semper Reformanda have so reformed the Christian faith that they have come full circle and are loudly pronouncing as biblical and reformed views which the reformers unanimously rejected. They find themselves not now more in agreement on these doctrines with late medieval theologians than with the reformers themselves. The reformers, as I hope was obvious through this lecture in this, of the 16th and 17th century, we look primarily at Hooker, they affirm natural theology, making it a necessary element of reformed orthodoxy. Why? Because they read the scriptures. They read the scriptures as saying that all men have access to naturally known truths about God, man, and morality. 
They read the early church fathers as affirming that doctrine and seeing it in the scriptures, and they read the pagans themselves and found the pagans, amidst many errors, pronouncing many truths about God, man, and morality. In other words, the scriptures said something was the case, and when they looked at the history of the world, it was there. And so they affirmed it. Hmm. God is so revealed in his good creation that all men can know via intuition and inference that God is, that God is powerful, wise, and the creator of the cosmos. These truths are so obvious that men are guilty without excuse for denying them and for committing adultery. And now who cares? And I conclude with these, this final point. Who cares? Well, Reformed theologians like Hooker suggest that they are important not only because we have in them knowledge of God and man, which we know to be true, because this helps us to properly interpret scriptures. They, as we saw with Hooker, he says that this, these truths help to convert us and to confirm us. Put in other terms, natural theology is useful for evangelism as we pre present the faith to unbelievers with reasons to believe. We demonstrate them that God, to them that God is. It is useful in polemics as we defend the faith from the assault of heretics both within the church and without. It is useful in pastoral ministry as we encourage believers to remain faithful to and to worship rightly the God who is the sovereign creator of the cosmos and who gives them their being and who maintains them in being as they live their lives. Indeed, this is what Stephen Charnock suggests when he talks about using natural theology to confront and refute practical atheism in the pews. He thinks you should preach. Stephen Charnock thinks you should preach natural theology from the pulpit. And it's used in, in biblical hermeneutics to help us to better understand the scriptures, to avoid the errors of many who, like Joseph Smith, for example, deny the truths of natural revelation and conveniently discover a God and moral law of their own making in the words of inspired scriptures. Richard Hooker, then, calls us to submit ourselves, intellect and will, to God's twofold creation, revelation, nature, and scripture. Not elevating one above the other, but recognizing that they both come from God, both speak of God, and both demand that we conform ourselves to God's divine and eternal will. Thank you. This presentation was made possible by the generous contributors to the Serious Joy Scholarship, permitting our graduates to launch into life and ministry without a burden of student loan debt.